Well, yesterday in, in this very uh, sanctuary, in this very room, something very wonderful uh, took place, and that is a, a wedding. And uh, weddings are so marvelous and uh, glorious, not only because there's this joy and celebration that you can just sense in the room and, and witnessing God's hand, bringing two individuals together, but it's also wonderful because there's something sacred about weddings, something sacred. Uh, there's something hallowed and set apart in marriage. God created it. God is the one who designed the marriage. It's his hand that works to bring two people together to carry out this act of making vows and becoming one. And because weddings have a sacredness to them, it means they also have a kind of propriety, appropriateness, or reverence that ought to accompany them. At a wedding, everybody knows what role they have, what role they do not have. If you're a guest at a wedding, and some of you were a guest yesterday, you know uh, you do not belong up front with the groomsmen and the bridesmaids. And if before the service you said to me, uh, Pastor, I'm, I'm just a guest, but actually I thought about it, I'd like to be up front with the groomsmen and the bridesmaids, I would say, no, you're not. <laughs> That's not happening. It's not fitting. It's not proper. Or if someone said, uh, before the, the bride and groom uh, take their vows when they're up front, just, just give me a minute. I want to come up front and just say a few words to them and, and to those gathered. I would say, no, you're not. It's not fitting. It's not going to happen. Uh, sacred things require a certain reverence and care about them. Well, we're in the book of Daniel. Uh, we have heard the first part of chapter 5 uh, from the Old Testament reading, how a particular Babylonian king did not handle with any care, with any reverence, the things, the vessels of the Lord. And as Daniel and his companion, companions continue in exile, we see how God continues to be at work and really teaching about the centrality of the heart, having a humble, worshipful heart, and orienting one's life around the things that are uh, sacred, that are precious to our Lord. So we'll continue in Daniel chapter 5, picking up at verse uh, 13. Listen now to God's word. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I've heard of you, and that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself. Give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. Whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, that is Nebuchadnezzar, and, and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven." And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. You've praised the gods of silver, gold, 
of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Main, Main, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Main, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, or Parson, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. In C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, um, Lewis says quite famously, Uh, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Uh, Those who say to God, thy will be done. That that is, I believe in you. I've, I've humbled myself before you. Your will be done. And then there's those to whom God will say in the end, thy will be done. That is, you've chosen your path. And you've chosen uh, destruction. Part of what we're seeing unfold at this point in the story of Daniel are two Babylonian Gentile kings whose destiny, yes, sovereignly ordained by God, yet choose their end. Choose whether it, was be, it would be pride or whether it would be humility that would be their response to the word of God. And we will see that unfold. Recall that in Daniel 1.1, the opening verse of the book, we're told it was in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, God's people, that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem and exiled God's people. That was the year 605 B.C. The last verse of chapter 1, which we've looked at before, says this, that Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus, the king of Persia. That year being 538, 539 B.C. So there in chapter 1, you have a snapshot telling us Daniel was there in exile, preserved by God, used by God, for a nearly 70-year period of time. From the Babylonian siege to the time that the Medes and the Persians, which we've just heard, would conquer the Babylonians and become the dominant empire in the ancient Near East at that time. All the while, God's people are in a bit of a washing machine getting tossed to and fro uh, by one empire after another. Well, here in chapter 5, we come to the last king in Babylon, Belshazzar. And one of the clear things, or one of the emergent things through this text and lessons we learn really centers around the theme of change. One, how fast change can occur, religiously, politically, culturally. Two, how unstable, the change, how unstable change is as a foundation upon which we are to build our, our faith and rest upon. And three, the kind of people we are to be through whatever change occurs. Namely, Daniel is, is an example for us, and through Daniel, our Lord Jesus Christ, through various Uh, seasons of change, what kind of people are we to be? There's no reason to doubt that godly change, great change, had occurred under Nebuchadnezzar as a result of his own godly transformation, his own conversion at the end of chapter 4. You you see at the end of chapter 4 in verse 36, his own counselors and lords looked to him in his reform. Recall as well, he was someone who had, who had promoted education early on. We learn of that in the book. And very important is that uh, when the Babylonians laid siege upon Jerusalem, we're specifically told that in the opening verses of the book, he took the vessels of the temple and he preserved them. Now, true, the Lord was at work to preserve these sacred things. But Nebuchadnezzar chose to do so. 
Now, it took a long time for the Lord to get hold of Nebuchadnezzar's heart, but eventually he professes. He seems to convert. There at the end of chapter 4, this is God's kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, and he recognizes it. And there, there seems to very likely be change and reform for the good. But then we move into chapter 5, how great a change, how, how great a fall, a, a degeneration takes place under this last king, Belshazzar. You see that in the opening four verses. He puts on this great feast. He demands to have those vessels of the Lord taken out. And as John Calvin says, this was an act of ridicule and insult toward God. It's not just carelessness. It's an insult toward God directly. Right? We read, they're acting in revelry, in decency, drinking out of the vessels of God. They're praising the gods of silver, bronze, and stone. There's a word for what's going on here. It is profane. It's profane. I was reminded recently, just a few months ago, actually at one of our elders' meetings, one of the elders was pointing out the difference between uh, vulgarity and profanity. Now, full disclosure, neither vulgarity or profanity was happening at the elders' meeting. Be sure. Be sure. But it was an important distinction that was being made. I think I'll use, throw around that word profanity when actually what I meant, what I meant was vulgarity. Uh, they're very different. Vulgarity is bad taste. We think of someone using words that are bad or having a, a potty mouth. Uh, carelessness, vulgarities. Profanity is different, though. Profanity is defiling something that is holy and sacred. That's what's, that's what's happening here. And it's no light thing. It's kind of like turning a sanctuary into a brothel. There's something very sacrilegious about what the king, Belshazzar, and the people are doing and very likely, in fact, we know from the text, uh, Belshazzar had learned what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. The, the revelation of God, the proclamation of the truth from Daniel. And you read through and you wonder, in chapter 5, where is Daniel? He doesn't seem to be dependent upon it or looked to in the same way that Nebuchadnezzar was in, in responding to him. But we also uh, see the fact that that it had been revealed that this kingdom will come to an end. That had been revealed to Nebuchadnezzar. Surely, Belshazzar has heard these things. He knew about these things. John Calvin makes the point, when the reprobate, and it's very likely Belshazzar is among them, uh, when the reprobate know the end is near, they rush forward toward destruction. Right? The king and people are kind of giving God the fist, this act of profanity. And we'll consider this just a little bit more in a moment. But here we see the point that change is not a good foundation to build our lives upon or to trust in. If you're Daniel or another faithful Israelite and you saw great and godly reform under Nebuchadnezzar, religiously, culturally, the warning here is do not trust in the change itself, because it may change again. But trust in the one who brings the change about. So we have to be careful not to build our hopes on the success of the past. If you're older than me, you, better than me and better than those younger than me, could well testify to the kinds of changes that you have seen culturally, maybe spiritual degeneration or spiraling in certain ways over the last 25 or 50 years in our own culture or nation. You could simply look at certain parts of the world and history, Western Europe, through and following the Protestant Reformation. We give praise to God, for sure, for reform, godly reform. But to build one's hope and security on that change, on that reform, is to build a little bit on sand. No, our hope is in the God who reforms, the God who brings it about. Paul said to Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Well, what does that mean? 
when it's convenient and when it is not convenient. That's what Daniel is an example of. Perseverance, a constant presence, depending upon the truth of God, through the changes. In season and out of season. When you've got a a tailwind, things are going your way, culturally, religiously, but also when you have a headwind. John Calvin makes the point on uh, Paul's words to Timothy, in season and out of season, saying Paul means here that not only pastors, but all believers are to not only be perseverant, but aggressive in overcoming our difficulties. Believers living under the evil of Belshazzar's reign would have to strain forward with zeal and perseverance and trust in the Lord. We see something else happening uh, in this chapter, and it centers on uh, the biblical doctrine of election and rejection. At this point in Daniel 4 and 5, we see very well two kings contrasted, two men who respond in different and contrasting ways to the word of the Lord that comes to them, that gets proclaimed to them, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And the scripture has a long line of examples contrasting the the elected, the accepted, and the rejected. We think of Cain and Abel. Abel brings an offering that is pleasing unto the Lord. Uh, Cain's is rejected. There's something wrong in in, in the heart of, of Cain. We think of Jacob and Esau, of course. Jacob, we're told, the Lord loved. Esau, he passes over. He rejects. And at some level in these things, there is mystery. Why God's saving mercy extends to transform some, but to others he passes over is mysterious. Why he kept after Nebuchadnezzar till Nebuchadnezzar's heart was brought down and he humbled himself, but not so Belshazzar. There's mystery there. And at one level, the biblical answer is that it is due to the sheer sovereign will of God. Paul says this in Romans. He has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. But to only speak of election and rejection as a matter of the sovereignty of God would be to miss an all-important emphasis through the Scriptures, and that is the heart of man, the will of man. Daniel communicates, he preaches to both kings. But the difference comes in verse 22 and verse 23 of our text. As Daniel is speaking to Belshazzar, contrasting him from Nebuchadnezzar, he says, But you, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Though you knew all this, you knew how God had revealed himself to King Nebuchadnezzar. You knew how Nebuchadnezzar humbled his heart before the Lord. You you knew of this godly change, but you have lifted up yourself before the Lord of heaven. Ronald Wallace makes a point here. He says, What comes out clearly within this dynamic encounter is that when Belshazzar so perversely said no to God, his refusal served only to demonstrate, justify, and seal upon his experience the fact that God was saying no to him. And God was saying no with the same almighty power and unquenchable zeal as was behind his desire to save this lost man. God is always Lord even when a man is being perverse and being damned because he refuses to be saved. This means that Belshazzar was rejected while Nebuchadnezzar was elected. Yet he who was rejected deliberately chose to be so, and he who was elected deliberately responded to the grace that saved him. Perhaps that is a central question that all people face when confronted with the word of God and the gospel of Christ. Will I choose the path of pride and walk by my own rules and values and ambitions, or will I choose today the path of humility before the Lord to seek His will, His kingdom? We see what happens as soon as the pride of Belshazzar comes to the surface. Verse 5 says, immediately the writing begins to appear. This is the judgment of God. Those words in verse 24, main, main, tekel, parson, the words are like three weights in 
uh, descending scale. It's like saying a hundred weight a pound an ounce or a dollar a dime a penny. It's a picture of the spiral or degeneration and decline of, of the king's kingdom and his rejection uh, by the Lord. Right? Your days have been numbered. You've been weighed in the balance and you will be divided, given over now to the Medes and the Persians. Perhaps most important and applicable for us is our treatment of the sacred and the holy. In every age, people are put to the same test because God still has his holy things, holy vessels. Today, we would probably say the holy things of God are the means of grace. The means of grace that our confession refers to. Those things that God has prescribed and attached to his son, Jesus Christ. Those things by which one knows Christ, grows in Christ, and honors Christ. The word of God. Prayer. The sacraments. Worship. Fellowship. These are not common things. They're holy things. They're holy things. I remember uh, our family's first trip as a young person to, uh, to the Capitol. We drove, I believe we drove from Seattle to Washington, D.C., and we were touring around, and we came to that monument referred to or uh, mentioned as, as the tomb of the unknown soldier. Um, soldiers whose, whose remains are uh, not identified. And there at that monument... Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, a soldier uh, marches back and forth on that ground uh, to protect it uh, as, as a way of, of revering it, honoring. All seasons, snow, hail, rain. And if you were gathered there with other people, uh, you would see most of the time people are very reverent, subdued, solemn. Right? Why? Because that's what's fitting. It's a kind of hollowed ground, if you will, calling for reverence. Well, we're living in a culture that is increasingly secular in various ways. And there are few, if anything, anymore that's considered sacred. Sacred. Few things are treated with reverence. If you were to go out today and drive in nearby towns, into Manchester, uh, into Hartford, it would appear no different than any other day of the week. Few, few in these parts are worshiping the Lord with the people of God. The Sabbath is no longer treated with uh, a sacredness. Marriage has been defiled by many, no longer viewed as sacred. Uh, the Bible itself sits on the shelves of many homes. It's viewed like any other book by many people. One author said, The danger for most of us today is not so much that of committing Belshazzar's kind of sacrilege. Our temptation is simply to the careless use and lighthearted neglect of these means of God's grace. For Shelly and I's, my wife and I's 20 years of, of marriage, 20, right? Just joking. Um, <laughs> with few exceptions, few exceptions, we, we set out on, on this uh, from, from year one and we've carried it out. Each week we go on a, a date night, and I know some of you uh, do that uh, as well. That usually involves going out to eat, and, and on special occasions we'll go out to somewhere a little bit nicer. And for those times, we usually dress up a little bit a little bit better. And uh, why would we do that? We would be no less married. There would be no less love or acceptance if we dressed down with sweatpants and an old t-shirt. It's because it fits the occasion. Think about why, why do people dress up for a wedding? Fits the occasion, right? When it comes to one's whole life before our holy God, it is fitting to arrange, right, to arrange our lives around that which he values. And that's one of the great fights in the Christian life. Am I valuing the things that he values? 
We were made for that. That's where delight and joy is found. My children have on occasion done something I used to do when I was a child, and uh, I'm sure uh, young people here, you've probably done this, and that is you rearrange your room. If you share a room, I need some collaboration, but you, you rearrange your room. So that might mean moving the bed from one uh, place in the room to another, turning the dresser a little bit, a couple other things. And now the space in that room looks quite uh, different. Our lives are like that. Our lives are a certain, have a certain space. And sometimes things need to be reordered. Sometimes things need to just get out of the room altogether. Now, I'm not suggesting a moral self-cleanup effort, but rather just highlighting how important ordering and reordering our lives are around the things that our God considers holy. Worship with the people of God, His Word and devotion, fellowship, the Lord's table, prayer, so that at the center of that room is the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ, this one who pursued us with his love and gave himself for us. Paul puts it this way in, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ compels us, moves, controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. What, what higher calling is there than to order our lives around the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for your hand of providence, your hand of redemption in the life of your church. Lord, for the preciousness of your word. Lord, for the means of grace that you have given to us that we might uh, grow in grace and more know, know, know more of your favor and your mercy uh, upon your people. Uh, we pray that you would be uh, gentle and tender with us, Lord, as your flock. Um, convict where there needs conviction. Encourage where there needs to be encouragement. Um, Lord, all for the, for, the, for the purpose of bringing glory to your name and also joy to us as your people. Help us, Lord, to help one another in seeking first the things of God in your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for, um, for your Holy Spirit that is at work in the lives of your people uh, to order our lives accordingly. And Lord, m- may we fall and rest upon your grace, um, for it is sufficient. You are sufficient for us. Uh, for this we pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.